So in this video, we want to talk about how membranes work, the components that make it up, and how they both contribute to the overall function of what, con what goes in and, also in and out across the membrane. So if we think about where we find membranes first, certainly all cells have a cell membrane to control what goes in and out of the cell, but also eukaryotic cells have membranes in, uh, in their organelles or around their organelles. So the mitochondrion, for example, right here has a membrane so they can control what goes in and out across the, uh, in and out of the mitochondria itself. So, um, as it turns out, all membranes work broadly the same way. And so when we think about uh, this picture here, I want you to imagine any membrane, the cell membrane or the mitochondrial membrane. Uh, if we kind of zoomed in, we might see something that looks like this. And so again, our goal is to really address the idea of how membranes control what go in and out of them. Um, a very fancy term for that, selective permeability. They can select what permeates them or sort of goes across. And in order to do that, we really want two broad functions. We need some kind of a part that blocks most things from crossing. Um, as it turns out, that's going to be our phospholipid bilayer, which is really kind of all of this right here. We call it a bilayer because really there's two different layers of these guys with heads and tails. And so we'll talk about them first and how they block. And then ultimately we'll talk about transport proteins that kind of represent the selectors. They're going to uh, select particular particles to go through them, and we'll show how that works second. So let's talk about the phospholipid bilayer first. I kind of like to use the metaphor of a fence. Uh, fences are pretty good at blocking certain things from crossing. So here's just a, a quick little picture of a cattle fence. Uh, quite effective at blocking large animals from being able to cross from one area to the other, um, but maybe not completely um, able to block everything. So maybe like there are little insects that have no trouble at all kind of going right through um, the giant holes in the fence here. And so we'll see that the phospholipid bilayer is kind of the same way. It can block lots of things, but it can't quite block everything from crossing. Um, although it's going to work in a slightly different way from the cattle fence, uh, mostly the phospholipid bilayer is able to block because of its polarity. And so let's say when we talk about that a little bit, um, polarity is charge. Um, if you remember me talking about water being a polar molecule because it's charged, as it turns out, the phospholipids are kind of special molecules. They have a polar part to them. As it turns out, that's the heads. So they do have charge. Either positive or negative things are polar. Um, and then the phospholipids also have a nonpolar part. That's the lipid part. That's the fat part. And fats are nonpolar. That means they um, have no charge at all. And as it turns out, it's really nifty that they have a polar and nonpolar part because the polar heads just kind of um, help the uh, phospholipid bilayer face the water that exists inside and outside the cell. But the nonpolar middle is really the functional part. That's the part that's actually doing the blocking because if you uh, think of like oil and water mixed together, the polar water and the nonpolar oil uh, don't mix. Nonpolar and polar things really like don't like each other for our purposes. And so um, if most things that are dissolved in the water um, around your cells and inside your cells are polar, then most particles like say sugar that dissolves well in water are not going to be able to go through the nonpolar middle. They're going to be blocked. Just like uh, oil and water don't like each other, the polar sugar and the nonpolar tails in the middle really don't like each other. And likewise, there might be things inside of the cell, like maybe a positively charged particle, um, that's not going to be able to go through that nonpolar middle either. And so, as I was saying, the phospholipid bilayer is really good at blocking anything with a charge. Um, and it's that nonpolar thick middle part that's doing that. Now, um, as I was saying before, um, just like that fence, the phospholipid bilayer can't block everything. It can't block anything that's already nonpolar. And as it turns out, there are just going to be maybe two particles that we're going to talk about that um, are nonpolar, have no charge, and that's going to be oxygen. Oxygen can go right through really easily, and so can carbon dioxide. So it turns out that's just fine because we want those things to be able to cross 
when they're needed for cellular respiration, let's say with oxygen, and when we want to get rid of them like carbon dioxide. So here's kind of just a really quick summary of that in case you want to pause the video. We talked about how the nonpolar middle part of the phospholipid bilayer blocks anything with charge, but it can't block anything that's not charged. Okay, and let's move on to the selectors then because uh, ultimately there might be some polar things that we still want to let cross across a membrane. And so transport proteins are in charge of that. If the phospholipid bilayer is like a fence, then the transport proteins are kind of like gate guards. Um, they're controlling and they're allowing very particular particles to be able to cross the membrane because transport proteins, just like enzymes, have a very specific shape to be able to fit the particle that they then let through them and across the membrane. So maybe this little um, sugar particle right here, this little hexagon is able to go through this transport protein only because it fits the protein and goes through, whereas maybe this oval particle right here um, can't go through that protein. Maybe there's another protein in the membrane that fits it and enables it to cross. And if things can cross into the cell, um, they can also use the same transport protein to um, leave the cell as well. And so just if, if there are maybe thousands of different polar particles that we want to let in or out of a cell, then we maybe need thousands of differently shaped transport proteins to fit those particles and let them cross. If something doesn't have a transport protein for it, then we're not going to let it cross um, the, the membrane at all. Okay, so here's kind of a quick summary of what we were talking about with transport proteins. And so, just kind of even in bigger summary, we said that um, really our goal here was to talk about how membranes control what goes across them. And there are two major players, the phospholipid bilayer, which mostly blocks, and the transport proteins, which select certain particles to be able to go through.